Right now, while you're watching this, rescue teams are pulling bodies from mud in five different countries. Over 1,200 people are dead. Hundreds more are still missing, buried under landslides or swept away by floods. Two cyclones struck within days of each other, unleashing catastrophic destruction across South and Southeast Asia. One of them formed in a place where tropical cyclones simply don't happen. Scientists are calling it unprecedented. Governments are calling it a national emergency. And the death toll is still climbing. This is what happened. Between November 22nd and 28th, two tropical cyclones tore through South and Southeast Asia with devastating force. Cyclonic Storm Senyar and Cyclonic Storm Ditwa struck Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Malaysia, and India in rapid succession, creating a cascade of flooding, landslides, and infrastructure collapse that authorities are describing as one of the worst natural disasters the region has seen in decades. The numbers tell a brutal story. More than 840 people are still missing, vanished into floodwaters, buried under debris, or swept away by rivers that became torrents overnight. Roughly 1.8 million people have been displaced from their homes, forced into evacuation shelters, stranded on rooftops, or camping on higher ground while waiting for rescue. Entire neighborhoods have been submerged, roads have been severed, bridges have collapsed. Communication networks went dark across vast stretches of affected areas. Senyar formed first, materializing in the Strait of Malacca on November 22nd, before slamming into northern Sumatra on November 26th. Days later, Ditwa spun up in the Bay of Bengal, crossing Sri Lanka on November 28th and bringing what officials are calling the island nation's worst floods in a decade. The storms moved fast, hit hard, and left behind scenes of devastation that emergency responders are still struggling to reach. In Thailand's Songkhla province, the city of Hat Yai, home to over 150,000 people, was effectively drowned. In Indonesia's North Sumatra, entire mountain villages were buried under landslides triggered by relentless rainfall. In Sri Lanka's central highlands, rivers overflowed, dams breached, and hillsides gave way, sending waves of water and mud crashing into communities below. But the breaking news is this. The death toll is still rising. Search and rescue operations are ongoing, and officials are warning that as teams reach more isolated areas, the true scale of this disaster will become even more horrifying. What made these storms so deadly wasn't just their strength, it was where they formed and how much water they dropped in such a short time. Cyclone Senyar materialized in the Strait of Malacca, a narrow waterway between Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. This is only the second tropical cyclone ever documented forming there. The first was Typhoon Vame in 2001. These storms aren't supposed to happen in this location. The region sits too close to the equator, where the Coriolis effect is typically too weak to generate cyclonic rotation. But Senyar defied the rules. It spun up, intensified, and made landfall on a region utterly unprepared for such an event. Then came the rainfall in Hat Yai, Thailand. Meteorological stations recorded 335 millimeters, that's over 13 inches, of rain in a single day. Experts are calling it a once in 300 years event. To put that in perspective, imagine nearly a foot and a half of water falling from the sky in 24 hours. Drainage systems designed for monsoon rains were overwhelmed within hours. Multiple rivers overflowed simultaneously. Floodwaters rose to 2.5 meters, over eight feet, in urban areas, submerging ground floors, trapping families in upper stories, and turning streets into rivers. Meanwhile, Cyclone Ditwa approached Sri Lanka from the Bay of Bengal, drenching the island's mountainous interior. The combination of steep terrain, saturated soil, and relentless downpours triggered hundreds of landslides. Entire hillsides liquefied and slid downward, burying homes, blocking roads, and severing vital transportation links. In some areas, the ground itself became unstable, swollen with water, unable to hold its shape. Indonesia's Sumatra was hit by a similar mechanism. Decades of deforestation and peatland degradation have left the landscape vulnerable. 
Industrial canal construction has drained wetlands that once acted as natural sponges during heavy rains. When Senyar unleashed its deluge, there was nothing to absorb the water. It ran off hillsides, carved new channels, and swept through valleys with the force of a dam break. These weren't just storms, they were hydrological catastrophes, systems that dumped more water than the land could handle in places where infrastructure wasn't built to withstand such extremes. 631 people are confirmed dead in Indonesia. 390 in Sri Lanka. Between 176 and 267 in Thailand, the exact count is still uncertain because rescue teams haven't reached every affected area yet. Smaller numbers in Malaysia and India bring the total past 1,200. But these aren't just statistics. They're mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, entire families wiped out in minutes. In North Sumatra, residents described watching their neighbors' homes slide down mountainsides, buried under waves of mud and debris. Survivors spoke of hearing screams in the darkness, then silence. In Sri Lanka's Kandy district, families were trapped in upper floors as floodwaters rose around them, waiting for rescue boats that took hours to arrive. In Hat Yai, elderly residents who couldn't climb stairs were found drowned in their ground floor apartments. Over 25,000 homes have been destroyed in Sri Lanka alone. Families who evacuated with nothing but the clothes on their backs are now living in emergency shelters, unsure if their houses are even standing. In Indonesia, more than 28,000 structures have been damaged or obliterated. Schools, hospitals, community centers, critical infrastructure that communities depend on have been washed away or rendered unusable. This isn't a disaster that's confined to rural villages. Major cities have been crippled. Hat Yai is one of Thailand's largest urban centers. Colombo's suburbs were inundated. Transportation networks across multiple countries have been severed, isolating communities and delaying aid. Power grids failed, leaving hundreds of thousands in darkness. Communication towers went offline, cutting families off from information and from each other. And for those hoping this will simply calm down and allow recovery to begin, the experts have bad news. Sri Lanka's President Anura Kumara Disanayake didn't mince words when he addressed the nation. He called Cyclone Ditwa the largest and most challenging natural disaster in Sri Lanka's history. Those aren't the words of a politician downplaying a crisis. That's an official acknowledging that the country is facing something it has never dealt with before. Thailand's Prime Minister Anutin Charnvirakul issued a public apology, admitting to shortcomings in flood management. Translation, the systems failed. The preparations weren't adequate. The response wasn't fast enough. Behind the scenes, the scale of the response tells its own story. Sri Lanka deployed over 25,000 military personnel for search and rescue operations, the largest domestic military mobilization the island has seen outside of wartime. Helicopters, naval boats, armored vehicles, the entire defense apparatus has been thrown into disaster response. Indonesia's President Prabowo Subianto personally visited all three affected provinces. Civil society organizations are now urging the government to declare a national emergency, arguing that the current response framework isn't sufficient for a disaster of this magnitude. When governments are apologizing, presidents are visiting flood zones and experts are calling for emergency declarations, that's not reassurance. That's alarm, and the situation isn't stabilizing. It's compounding. Thailand is now calculating economic damage estimates that have reached $3.11 billion. That's not just property loss. That's shattered livelihoods, destroyed businesses, and agricultural devastation that will take years to recover from. Over 700 kilometers of roads have been damaged or destroyed, cutting off trade routes and access to markets. The educational impact is staggering. 58 schools in Thailand's southern provinces have been damaged, forcing 76,000 children out of classrooms. That's an entire generation's education disrupted. Some of these facilities won't be rebuilt for months, maybe years. In Sri Lanka, 25 to 30 percent of the country lost power when two major hydropower plants, Katmale and Rantambe, shut down after a critical power cable failure. The dam on the Mavil Aru was breached in 10 locations, forcing mass evacuations downstream, 
A Sri Lanka Air Force helicopter crashed during relief operations, killing the pilot. A grim reminder that even the rescue efforts are dangerous. Infrastructure is collapsing faster than it can be repaired. Casualties are mounting faster than they can be counted. And the pattern is clear. This disaster is still unfolding. The last time a tropical cyclone formed in the Strait of Malacca was December 2001. Typhoon Vame spun up at 1.4 degrees north of the equator. The closest any tropical cyclone has ever been documented forming to the equatorial line. It killed five people in Malaysia and caused significant flooding. Meteorologists considered it a freak event, an anomaly that wouldn't repeat. 24 years later, Cyclone Senyar proved them wrong. Climate research now shows that sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean have risen between 1.2 and 1.4 degrees Celsius over the past four decades. Warmer waters provide more energy for cyclone formation and intensification. The rules that once governed where and when tropical cyclones could form are changing. And the last time readings looked like this, the region wasn't prepared. This time, they still weren't. Sri Lanka has declared a state of emergency. Indonesia's three most affected provinces have done the same, with emergency declarations extending through mid-December. Thailand's government has activated its National Disaster Response Command. But the most revealing indicator of how serious authorities are taking this isn't the official alert levels. It's the international response that's pouring in. India launched Operation Sagarbandhu, deploying over 53 tons of relief supplies by air and sea. The Indian Navy sent its aircraft carrier INS Vikrant along with support vessels to assist with evacuations and supply deliveries. Over 2,000 stranded Indians have been evacuated from affected areas, along with more than 150 foreign nationals. The United States committed $2 million in emergency aid. China pledged $1 million plus additional supplies. Australia, the United Kingdom, Nepal, and the Maldives have all sent financial assistance. SpaceX activated free Starlink satellite internet service across Sri Lanka and northern Sumatra to restore communications. When international militaries are deploying aircraft carriers and satellite companies are providing emergency infrastructure. Someone knows this is far from over. Cyclone Ditwa has weakened to a deep depression and is expected to dissipate within the next day. Senyar has already broken apart over the South China Sea. The immediate cyclonic threat has passed, but the crisis isn't over. It's transitioning. Heavy rainfall is forecast to continue across Tamil Nadu, Puducherry, and coastal Andhra Pradesh through at least December 4th. Indonesia's meteorological agency is predicting light to moderate rain through the week. That means more water falling on already saturated ground. That means continued flooding risk. That means the possibility of additional landslides in areas where hillsides are already destabilized. The search for the missing continues. Hundreds of people are still unaccounted for, buried under landslides, swept downstream, or trapped in areas rescue teams haven't yet reached. Officials have warned that as those remote communities become accessible, the death toll will rise. Infrastructure damage will take months to repair. Some roads won't be rebuilt before the next monsoon season. Some communities won't have power restored for weeks. The World Bank is conducting rapid damage assessments to determine the full economic cost. Estimates that are expected to climb as the true extent of destruction becomes clear. As of this recording, rescue helicopters are still flying missions over Sumatra's mountain valleys. Naval vessels are still evacuating stranded families from Sri Lanka's flooded lowlands. Emergency shelters across five countries are still housing well over a million displaced people who have nowhere else to go. The immediate storm systems have weakened, but the systems that allowed this disaster to become so catastrophic haven't changed. Deforested hillsides are still vulnerable to landslides. Inadequate drainage infrastructure is still overwhelmed by extreme rainfall. Communities built on floodplains are still at risk, and ocean temperatures are still rising providing fuel for the next cyclone that defies conventional meteorological expectations. The questions that matter now aren't about what happened. They're about what happens next time. Will Sri Lanka's dams hold in the next deluge? Will Indonesia's mountain communities have early warning systems before the next landslide? Will Thailand's southern cities have flood barriers before the next once in 300 years event? 
which climate models suggest may now occur far more frequently. This isn't over. It's paused. Over 1,200 dead, hundreds still missing, nearly 2 million displaced, five countries struggling to recover, and climate scientists warning that storms like these will only become more common. Stay informed, stay prepared, and keep watching, because this is the new normal, whether we're ready for it or not.